Start basketball. Hey, hoop heads! Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Doctor Dish Basketball. We've had their partnership manager and training specialist Jefferson Mason, and marketing manager Nick Bartlett on the show in the past, and we couldn't be more excited about what they're doing for the game of basketball. Their Doctor Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market and truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Beyond efficient reps, Dr. Dish provides training expertise and versatility designed to develop complete players. The new Dr. Dish CT machine has further revolutionized basketball training with over 150 plus on-demand individual and team workouts from some of the best coaches and trainers in the game. These workouts include video instruction and combine game-like shooting drills with ball handling, conditioning, and agility drills. Along with workouts, the Dr. Dish training management system also provides stat tracking and analytics to track progress and ensure accountability. These are just a few reasons why top programs like Duke, North Carolina, Louisville, Florida, Baylor, and countless others are upgrading to Dr. Dish. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com. Follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And make sure you mention the Hoop Heads podcast to get $300 off your next Dr. Dish purchase. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get out and get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. We always watch film before practices. And so we all sit down and coach plays the clip of D'Angelo. He's breaking the dude's ankles. And then you see me go nuts, stops it, and he doesn't say a word and he rewinds it. And he plays it again, and he rewinds it, and he plays it again. And he stands up, and he says, Jake, I love that so much that I'm going to put you on scholarship. And I was like, are you serious? And and he said, hell yeah. And then everybody just went bananas. Jake Lorbach is the video coordinator and player development coach at St. Edward High School in Lakewood, Ohio. Prior to coaching at St. Ed's, Lorbach was both a volunteer coach and graduate assistant coach at Cleveland State University. Jake played high school basketball at St. Ed's under his current head coach, Eric Flannery. Upon graduating from Ed's, Jacob enrolled at Ohio State as a regular student, passing up several potential opportunities to play Division III basketball. During his freshman year at Ohio State, Jacob played a ton of pickup hoops and dramatically improved his game. As a sophomore, he walked onto the basketball team, eventually earning a scholarship with the Buckeyes while playing for Coach Thad Mata. After graduating from Ohio State, Jacob was a financial advisor for two years before embarking on a career in coaching. Check out our website, hoopheadspod.com, where you can find every episode in our archive and get signed up to receive our weekly newsletter featuring podcast links, plus articles for coaches, parents, and players. After you've listened to this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and review in your favorite podcast app. Those reviews help others in the basketball community find our show. Make sure you're subscribed to the Hoopheads podcast so you never miss an episode. The pod is available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, and YouTube. Coaches, parents, and players, get ready to learn from the story of a young coach getting started in the profession as we talk to Jake Lorbach from St. Edward High School in Lakewood, Ohio. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads podcast. It's Mike Lindsay here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome to the podcast Jake Lorbach from St. Edward High School, the video coordinator and player development coach. Jake, welcome to the Hoop Heads podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Mike, man. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we're excited to be able to learn a little bit more about your basketball journey, talk about some of the unique experiences that you've had in the game, and want to start out by going back to the time when you were a kid and just talk a little bit about how you got introduced to the game of basketball and what made you fall in love with it. Okay, so I thought about this a lot um, because when I was a kid, basketball was never really my first choice. I was always a soccer and a football guy. Like I, I played a bunch of different sports. Like I was just a kid that wanted to do everything. Um, but I would say back when I was in fifth grade, that was when Trace McGrady was playing with the Magic, and that's how I kind of got introduced to basketball. And he was just making all of these spectacular plays, and so I just decided that 
I wanted to play basketball now too. So just added that to a very busy year. And I remember by myself, the, the very first version of the Tracy McGrady's, uh, they were white and blue. And then I ended up getting a Tracy McGrady jersey for my birthday that year. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of how I got in- introduced to it um, early on. That's so, awesome. I, I can remember, I st- now I'm a little bit older than you, or should I say a lot older than you. So I remember my very first pair of real basketball shoes were, was, were Converse Dr. J's, leather, uh, leather Converse Dr. J's. And those were... Those things meant everything to me. So Dr. J was my guy back when I got introduced to the game, and you got you got Tracy McGrady. So Jason, what do you got? I got I got I got LeBron's man. I my, right. like my first official pair of tennis like basketball shoes. I mean, I played like with regular tennis shoes, but I think his first I had his first editions. I wish I would still have them because that would be pretty Same. awesome. But they uh, they definitely don't exist in my house anymore. So I wish I could. yeah. So it started as Tracy McGrady's, and then eventually, I think by the time that I was in seventh or eighth grade, I had just completely transitioned to LeBron's. Like I was getting every single colorway. Like <laughs> my mom, she well, I grew, I grew eight inches in one year, uh, going from fifth grade to sixth grade. And so my mom, she she just decided to start buying me shoes that were like <laughs> an inch and a like in like a size and a half that were bigger than what I was actually wearing. So, right. But I just kept growing out of them things, so I just kept making my mom buy me some more. <laughs> Eight inches in a year, man. That's that's pretty good. That's that's a pretty good growth spurt. That was a painful year. Yeah. I, yeah, I like, bet it. I bet it was. Yeah, like my mom was getting all mad that she had to keep buying me all these new clothes. Cause another new pair of pants, Jake, come on. You, you, well, you have no idea how many conversations that I have with my mom about that. Like, just wear mom, shorts, man. Just wear shorts. <laughs> well, when you go to Catholic school, you know, Oh yeah. That's right. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 Like they frown upon shorts. So yeah, no choice. Yeah. No, no choice there. That's, that's hilarious. That is hilarious. All right. So McGrady's your guy. You get into the game of basketball a little bit when you're in fifth grade. So what was it besides, watching Tracy McGrady when you got out on the court and you were playing what about the game when you were playing it did you really love I the the thing I like most about it was that it wasn't really just like a position sport you like you had to do a lot of different things all at once and so if and so if you could be good at just like a handful of things like five different things you were going to be successful. Like I had a lot of fun just being around my teammates. We were playing offense and we were playing defense at the same time. Like, and then when the first win came, like that was just a very addictive feeling. And so, and so I was inside all the time and like, I have to worry about going outside in the cold. And so that kind of drew me to it as well. Um, but eventually as like time started to go on especially once i hit my growth spurt like two years later that's when like i really started to fall in love with the game because like i felt like i had a spot on the floor where i belonged and it was like my first sense of belonging uh especially with like sports right understood so while you were building up your interest in basketball what what did your schedule look like? Let's say when you're in like sixth, seventh grade, what other sports are you playing? What does your sports calendar Ooh. look like for, for you as a kid at that time? Cause again, we know that the trend has been that kids are under pressure, whether that's from parents or coaches or, you know, club directors, whatever. And, and again, not just talking about basketball, but any sport to, to specialize at an earlier and younger age all the time. You, you see that pressure out there for kids. Mm-hmm. So just talk a little bit about what your schedule was like when you were in that junior high, middle school age of what your what your sports calendar was looking like. So I love my mom and dad to death for this because they never gave me any sort of pressure to do one specific thing, especially when I was a kid. Um, so they like they always preached the academic side. Like they they said, as long as I got my good grades, I could do whatever I wanted. And so I was getting good grades. So I was playing football. And so that was end of summer. You're going through the fall. And then I went straight into basketball. And then from basketball, I went straight into baseball and track. 
So I played both sports uh, in the spring and then baseball would continue through the summer. Um, I didn't really do too much organized like AAU basketball probably until I was in eighth grade. Um, like I just hopped on a local team. So in the summers, that was even busier because I would have my baseball and then I would have travel basketball, especially in the spring too. Um, and then, and then going into Ed's as well, my freshman year at St. Edward High School, um, I was still doing all those things. So my first year in high school, I was still a tri-sport athlete. So I was playing football, basketball, and baseball. Um, and those things uh, definitely all ran together. So definitely <laughs> busy sure. schedule. Like, yeah, I always sure. had something going on. Yeah, no question. Plus the academic side of it, uh, you know, is yeah. – you know, you put all that together and you were, you were one busy freshman in high school. There's no question about that. So talk oh, about the decision, talk about the decision to attend St. Ed's. I know your older brother, you said when we talked before, you shared with us that he also went to St. Ed's, but just talk a little bit about the kind of the why behind how you chose St. Ed's. And then we can kind of get into what your high school sports experience looked like. Okay. Yeah. So I would say like my sense of motivation and my drive came from my brother, especially in our house as a family, because we preach the academics before sports. My brother might be the smartest person like in the world. Like I'm convinced of that. <laughs> like he had straight A's like all through grade school, all through high school. Uh, he was like a 4.5 GPA student. He had 35 on his ACT. So like, I always had to try to like keep up with him. Uh, so when he decided to go to Ed's, I was still in grade school. We're about three and a half years apart. Um, so that was four years as far as like school year goes. So when I was in grade school, he was going to St. Ed's because they had the best academics. It was the right fit for him. Um, so it, eventually when I graduated, from my grade school in junior high and I was choosing high schools, it, it, it was a no brainer that I wanted to go to Ed's because I had been going to all the football games. I had been going to basketball games. Like I fell in love with St. Edward basketball and that, and that was something that I was hell bent on being a part of. So that's kind of why I decided to go to St. Ed's. So did you, would you say at that point, by the time you were an eighth grader heading into your ninth grade year, was basketball your your number one sport? Like, was that the main driving force behind that's the sport I want to play in high school? Or did you still have the idea? Obviously, as a freshman, you played all of them. Was one ahead of the other at that point? Or I would where, say, where would you stay? Where would you say you were at that point in terms of your mindset? I would say basketball was number two, um, just because my brother was a football player, um, and football was big in our household. Like we've been Ohio state football fans our whole lives. Um, so I was paying attention more to football than I was basketball at the time. So when I came in, like I wanted to be that guy, the starter on the football team, like that was something I think I was a little bit more focused on ahead of basketball. Um, but throughout my freshman year, um, of high school, like I played football, I had an okay year. Um, I was stuck on the freshman team, which was a pretty normal thing here. And then through basketball, like I kind of came into my own a little bit. Like I started to figure out like how to actually like play the game because coach Flannery has such a good program here. And the coaches here were amazing and trying to preach like team basketball. Like I was growing a couple more inches, like, I think I was a six four freshman at the time. Like I was playing some pretty good basketball. I ended up getting called up to JV, um, ha like halfway through the year, uh, and then, and, and and then after that was when I, I started really to sense that basketball was going to become more of my sport than anything else. What was your first impression? If you can think back, I know it's hard because now you have you know, a very good relationship and a long-standing relationship with Coach Flannery. But what was your first impression of him back when you first got to St. Ed's as a freshman? What do you remember about that time and, and just 
the impression that he made on you right out of the gate? Oh man, well, I know he's gonna like. I know he's gonna listen to this, and he's probably <laughs> gonna give you some crap for this. But back when I was just a fourteen, back when I was just a fourteen year old, I used to look at Coach Flam like kind of like he was like a god, like like he was just this basketball. He was a basketball genius in the sense that he was producing players like your Delvon Rowe, your Tom Pritchard. Uh, you had Justin Staples, who was a dual sport athlete, uh, who ended up playing football for Illinois. And I remember coming into his office and, and I'm seeing all these jerseys on the walls. And I'm like, this is like a basketball powerhouse <laughs> that I'm stepping into. And he right. was a very intimidating guy back then. He's kind of softened up a bit now here. Uh, like He's a little bit more understanding. But back then, like, we can edit that out if you want. Yeah, no, 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 and that's just a testament to the success he's had. Like, but as coaches now, like we take a look back and we can't take credit for it. It's the players that are taking credit for it, or the players get all the credit. Um, but his ability to reach us and to motivate us and to push us to be the most successful people on and off the court. Um, well, like I knew that's what I was going to get by coming here. Understood. And I, I think that that's been obviously proven out over time. And, you know, we were fortunate enough to have Coach Flannery come on with us very mm -hmm. early in the show and got to sit down with him in his office. And, and just I told him when I left the podcast uh, that time, he and I we have known each other, but had never known each other to have that type of in-depth conversation. And I told him that when I walked out, I was, uh, you know, a much bigger fan of him and his program just mm -hmm. by the conversation that we were able to have and the things that he shared with me. And just, again, I just came away so impressed. And I think that anybody who gets involved with the program, whether from, you know, a player side or now you're on the coaching side of it, uh, you know, Eric does things the right way. And that's really what it all, you know, that's what it comes down to. And, and, and the success that he's had over the course of his career, I think speaks for itself. And, you know, the fact that you were able to be a part of it as both a player and then we'll get into it a little bit later as a coach, uh, you know, again, just to be able to be around somebody who's been such such a success, uh, you know, is is something that for you looking forward in your coaching career, I think is going to have, you know, a huge impact for you, uh, you know, as you move forward. So if we think about, you know, your time. So here you are, you're a freshman. You know, mm -hmm. you now you want to be involved. You know, you want to be involved with Coach Flannery. You're playing two other sports. Talk to me about the decision-making process in terms of when do you decide basketball is the main one? Do you drop off the other ones? I know you eventually win a state volleyball championship. So kind of talk mm -hmm. about the, the genesis of all these other things and, and how basketball fits in for the next couple of years. Okay. Yeah. So after my freshman year, uh, Coach, Flan Coach Flannery, he actually came up to me and he said, if you want to be on varsity, the next year you should really consider making basketball your primary and your only sport. And as soon as he said that, it, it was just an easy decision for me. That was, that was a very uncomfortable conversation that I had, a, that I had to have with my parents because <laughs> they like, they thought I was going to be this big football star. And like, I felt like I was letting them down uh, by telling them that, but for him to come up to me and to tell me that made it a very easy choice. And ultimately it was the best choice for me. Um, so I decided to quit football and quit baseball. Um, volleyball didn't come until after my second year. Uh, so my second year, um, I, I, I played varsity the whole year. Uh, we had a pretty good year. We ended up losing to Warren Harding in the Elite Eight, uh, which was 
w- which was kind of like a very disappointing feeling because I felt like we had a really good team that was capable of winning a state championship. Uh, so that only motivated us more um, to work in the off season. Uh, and then actually one of the other assistant coaches, Happy Dobbs, um, his, his son had played for Coach Flannery as well. Um, he came up to me and he was like, Jake, uh, we have volleyball here. I think it'd be a good idea for you to give it a shot just to work on your footwork and just to work on your athletic ability. Because at that time, like I wasn't really anything, like I wasn't really anything special in high school, but playing volleyball my sophomore year definitely, definitely paid off for me in basketball my junior year because my vertical had gone up. My footwork was the best it's ever been. Um, and it kept me active at a very high level because if anybody has ever seen volleyball played, like it, like it's constant movement, like it's constant jumping, uh, it doesn't stop. Uh, so that definitely conditioned me the appropriate ways that translate over to basketball. Um, and I think especially too in volleyball, like that, like that, like that might be the best team sport out there because you have six players just all connected on a high level. Like everybody has to do their job in order for things to go your way. Um, and just the, just the connectivity and like the camaraderie, like that was really awesome. And I tried to carry that over into my junior year. Um, and we actually had probably one of the better teams in San Diego history in my junior year. We just unfortunately uh, came up short um, in, in the Elite Eight. We ended up losing to, to Menor High School. Um, and that was a really tough one to swallow. Um, just because we, like, we had Twin Towers. We had two 6'11 guys. One ended up playing for Louisville. And then another went to Western Michigan. Matt Stainberg before he transferred to Xavier. Um, who's now playing overseas. He's having a hell of a career. Um, and then we had some really, really, really talented guards. And, and, it, and it just felt like we couldn't be stopped. But unfortunately, we came up short again that year. Um, and then I decided not to play volleyball my junior year because I felt like I needed to play AAU in order to get myself some exposure to potentially play in college. Um, so so – I took a year off from volleyball um, just to play AU. It was all right. Like, I didn't have the best summer. Um, and then going into my senior year, uh, that was kind of like an up and down year for me because I ended up being a starter. Uh, and then about halfway through the season, Coach Flannery came out to me and he said that he was going to bring me off the bench and, w- and we were going to go small. Uh, and then in that moment, like, you feel like you lost the entire world, but I felt like I was emotionally mature enough to understand and to realize that Coach Flannery was doing what was best for the team. And so I told them that was fine, and I understand it, if he thinks that's what's best, we're to go ahead and do it. Uh, so I, so, so I ended up coming off the bench and I tried to be the, the best teammate possible. And whenever I got in, I tried to do my best to help the team win. Like that was just my mindset. Uh, and then we came up short, uh, in sweet 16. I think we lost to Garfield Heights. Um, and then after that loss was when I was like, all right, we're going back to volleyball. Uh, <laughs> like, like, like I can't leave Ed's without a state championship. Yeah, because if you've ever had you you ever played had you ever played volleyball before you played that year for the first time? No, I had never played volleyball. Like, like it kind of gets a bad stigma if you never played it. But as soon as you played it, you're like, oh my god, this might be one of the best sports out there. Like, I highly recommend if there's any basketball players at a high school that offers boys volleyball go play boys volleyball because it's going to help you out so much on the basketball court. It's because you're playing on the same surface. Uh, and like, it's only going to help you athletically. Um, yeah, because I think I went from barely being able to dunk to jamming it like pretty dang easy, like throw out the backward of myself. Um, so 
it's a, it's a really fun sport too. So like, I hope that stigma starts to go away here soon. What was the learning curve like for you? Um, it was very difficult just because the technique to hit is very different from the way I jumped in basketball because for me, like I was a primarily right foot jumper. So I was dunking it with my left hand, but, but in volleyball for you to hit as a right-handed person, you had to do a right, left gather and then you're jumping and like, I cannot like I like I could probably only get like twelve inches off the ground, uh, so like so like I had a big problem like trying to hit, but as far as blocking goes, like that came naturally to me. Like I was always in front of the net, and and, and like all you had to do was just shuffle over, and you had to jump up, and then you just extend your arms over the net, and that's probably one of the cooler feelings is being able to block somebody else's hit and then have the ball just go directly back in their face. Like that's a yeah. very fun feeling. I believe it. I believe it. It's, it's just, to me, it's a very unique story. Cause uh, I just think that one, there's not too many schools, at least here in Ohio that right. off offer boys volleyball, number one. And then number two, especially in today's society, you just don't see people playing multiple sports and you certainly don't see the basketball volleyball combination too out of that. I think of Will Chamberlain when I think of volleyball playing basketball players. I think of Will who played, I think, on like the professional circuit at some point or some minor league circuit. I, I know back when he was uh, back when he was still alive in the, you know, in the. Do you remember 70s. Chase Budinger? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. My, Arizona, Arizona. Yep. He ended up playing uh, volleyball and basketball for them. Okay. And, okay. And, then, and I think now he's playing on the AVP, like the professional beach volleyball, he's playing on their circuit now. Okay. Wow. Uh, yeah. So like that was actually my inspiration back when I was in high school was I was a big fan of Chase Budinger. Like I watched, like I watched all the Arizona games because I heard that he played volleyball as well. And this dude's just jumping out the gym. Yeah. He was uh, jumping. He had, he had crazy hops, crazy hops. Uh, so that's kind of how I got into the whole volleyball thing. And, 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 and like, I'm so happy that happy Dobbs convinced me to give it a try. Uh, because I feel like if I didn't do that, I, I would have never had gotten the athletic ability that I had back when I was younger and I was playing. And you Uh, got your state title too. And I got my state title. Yeah. That was a crazy (laughs) feeling. It was a crazy feeling. We actually missed our graduation uh, because this because the state championship fell on the same day. That's very cool. How many uh, do you do you know off the top of your head like how many schools in Ohio have boys volleyball? I would probably say I probably pin it around back then. I think it was only thirty from okay. each okay. division. Gotcha. I think there was only one and two, only division okay. one and only division two. Okay. Uh, but pretty much all of your private Catholic schools um, would have it. So a lot of teams we played were were St. Xavier, and then we played Moeller. And okay. Then, and then a lot of the Columbus teams have them as well, like Hillier Bradley, Hillier Darby. Um, and then I think the only other team back then that was like near us in Cleveland that had a team was Ignatius. St. Okay. Ignatius. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still relatively small, but, I, but I do hope that it eventually does become an OHSAA sport. Yeah, that'd be very cool. I mean, again, I think that it's a sport, as you said, that when, when you think about skills that are at least from an athletic standpoint that are transferable to basketball mm-hmm. makes a ton of sense with the amount of jumping that you do that, you know, that there can be some transfer from an athletic standpoint from one back to the other. Uh, you know, if you're playing, if you're playing both of them. So, all right, let's, let's go back and talk, talk basketball. Give me a, a, a highlight or two from your high school career. If you had to pick out one or two things, favorite memories, uh, just, just give me one or two things from your high school career that stand out for you. I think the one that kept repeating itself was whenever we played at St. Ignatius, our rival, like those games are on a different level like it's a sellout crowd everybody's into it like the way that 
you play that game is a lot different than any other game that you play during the course of the year. Uh, just because like the rivalry was so real and you didn't want to let the school down. You didn't want to let your community down. Like there was just like a, a crazy sense of purpose. Um, and there was one matchup against St. Ignatius. It was my junior year. We were playing in the sweet 16. It was on St. Patrick's day. Uh, the St. Edward community is predominantly Irish, so you can imagine how that crowd was. We are playing at Cleveland State. It was one of the biggest crowds I've seen at a high school basketball game. And being able to beat them in the Sweet 16 just with, like, the whole community around you, uh, like, it felt like you were playing in a college game, uh, that, was, that, that, was, that was a really cool moment. Um, that was a really big, like, that was something I'll never forget. Um, and then I would say there was one of my better moments as a basketball player individually. Like, I don't like to hype myself up too much, but there was one play against Garfield Heights my senior year. Uh, we were going up against – they like they had, like, they had a really good team. They had Tony Farmer – um, and they had Trey Lewis and Trey Lewis had gotten a steal and, and I was sprinting down the floor and I was going after him and I, and I knew he was going up to dunk it. And so I, and so I took the risk and I jumped and thankfully, it, and thankfully it worked out in my favor and I didn't get dunked <laughs> on, but that was definitely one of my favorite moments was being able to make that play, uh, but it sucks too because we ended up losing that game. But that was definitely probably like my best moment as a basketball player at St. Ed's. <laughs> How vivid is that picture in your mind of that play? Like, it's pretty remember, vivid. Like, like, like it's pretty remember? vivid. But uh, but like I can't like I can't really remember like everything that happened before or after it. It was just in the heat of the moment, like just the just like the sense of adrenaline that's something i'll never forget do you have more of a view of it from your own point of view perspective or do you have more of a view of it of like the film that you watched of it which one do you see when you picture that in your head do you see it from your point of view or do you see it from the point of view of like watching that play on film well i've never seen that play on film ever all right so there you go so, there's the answer yeah 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 so it's just been an in the moment kind of memory burn it like burn into my brain uh back in high school we didn't really watch too much film like i didn't really get into film until i walked onto the basketball team at ohio state and like you had to watch film well like i didn't know that that was a thing <laughs> like, it's amazing how different that is and what the change has been we've talked with a bunch of coaches about that and you know there's people who obviously in their playing career watched little to no video at all and now, because of the technology, it's so easy, you know, to be able to watch it. The nice thing for you is, if there's no video, by the time you're 80 years old, you're gonna have pinned that dunk up by the square. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> it's gonna get That's higher. That, that collision is gonna be higher and higher every year. Oh, I know. So, yeah. Especially when there's no, especially when there's no proof one way or the other. That's the way to do it, Jake. Well, there might be proof, but I just asked Coach Flynn to not bring it up because back there in high go. school. I was like, I was a, like, I was a role player. Like I was just a guy that was in there that was going to play some defense. I was going to set solid screens. I was going to run the offense. Like I'd get an occasional few buckets, but I wasn't anything special. Head Start Basketball, along with members of the J. Billis Skills Camp staff, will be hosting the very first Prime Skills Camp, an affiliate of the J. Billis Skills Camp that is held annually in Charlotte, North Carolina. Prime Skills Camp will take place on the campus of Western Reserve Academy, just outside of Cleveland, Ohio, June 26th through the 28th, and will be designed for boys rising to grades 6 through 9. Prime Skills Camp will mirror the J. Billis Skills Camp in daily programming, teaching, coach to camper ratio, and quality of instruction. Prime Skills Camp brings all of the team-oriented individual instruction, focus on the fundamentals, and high-level coaching to young men aspiring to a high school varsity basketball experience. This camp is operated by Billis Camp veterans 
and includes the Jay Billis Coaches Development Program alongside the camp, ensuring that the quality of teaching and coaching at this camp is second to none. Please visit headstartbasketball.com or jbilliscamp.com for more information or to get registered. All right, so give players out there, and I think this is an important point to make, and I, I, it goes back to something that you said earlier as well about when Coach Flannery came to you and said, hey, we need you to come off the bench, and your reaction is, I don't want to say atypical, but your reaction is the one that we as coaches or as adults would hope that a 17- or 18-year-old kid would come back with, which is, okay, coach, I know it's the best thing for the team. I'm going to try to do the best I can in my role. But you and I both know that not everybody would hear that message from their coach and react in the same way that you did. And so talk a little bit about to players who may be out there just about what it means to play a role and how you felt being that role player and more importantly, probably how Coach Flannery made you feel as that player, how you felt valued, even though you weren't the leading scorer, even though you weren't the star of the team. Just talk a little bit about that experience and then kind of how Coach Flannery went about demonstrating that he valued you and the other players who maybe weren't the stars. I'll first say this your role is going to be defined by the amount of preparation that you do in the off season and what you're willing to do when the season eventually comes around, because I was a role player and because I wasn't doing everything that I needed to do in the off season to set our team up for ultimate success. That would be the one piece of advice that I can give the basketball players was because if I could go back in time and I could go back to the summers before our basketball seasons and just shoot every single day, just work on my handles just every single day, just watch way more basketball instead of worrying about all the other things like girls or things like that or parties or anything like that. Like I'm not saying that I was a party animal, but it's just like kids that age and especially even more now with social media is that there are a lot of different things that can distract you and take you away from what you're trying to do or what your goals are for the future. Because if I would have put in, a solid summer in for two to three years, I would like, my story would be completely different. Um, but just back then it didn't click for me. And so I didn't put in the extra work. Like I just thought that it was going to come to me naturally, but it never did. And so, and so when coach finally decided to bring me off the bench instead of starting me, like there was that voice in the back of my mind was like, all right, like you can't blame him because somebody else, the guy who replaced me, was working every single day. He was always in the gym before and after practice, just getting up the extra shots. Um, so, so for him to do that, a, I knew it was right, and b, like I knew the person that was replacing me deserved that spot, and then c, it motivated me to do everything that I can with the short amount of time that I've left to becoming a better basketball player because I'm not helping out the team as best as I can. Uh, so that's just kind of like the thought process that I did have. Of course, inside, like I was dying, like, right. I was pissed off. Like, or well, like I wanted to point the finger somewhere else, but but I, but I've always been the guy to point the finger at myself before I do that. Uh, so that's just kind of something that carried carried forward with me um, throughout my whole life, and, and I even do that today. Like I don't think that's something I'll ever do different. Well, it's a very mature response. That again, I, I'm not sure that every high school basketball player who is faced with that situation would have yeah. necessarily done. And I think there's 
there's a tremendous lesson to be learned by what you just said, which is, you know, you go back and, and you look at what maybe you could have done had you put in that extra time, had you put in that extra work. And I think ultimately, you know, the game rewards those people who put in that extra time and that extra mm-hmm. effort. And, you know, again, that's not to say that there aren't guys who are super, you know, quote, natural talents who can maybe get away with putting in a little less, uh, you know, a little less effort. But for most players, the guys who put in that extra effort are the ones that end up being rewarded with, whether it's more playing time or a bigger right. role or whatever the case might be. Yeah. And, and I think that the other thing that I took away from what you said is that as a player, uh, I think, you know, you're a kid and you start, let's say you start high school in ninth grade and you feel like you, you're going to play forever. And then you turn around you look back and you're like, man, my career's over. Mm-hmm. And, and you can never, you can never go back. Uh, you know, you, you get to be 25 years old and you don't get another chance to play high school basketball. That, that opportunity is over. And that's not to say that you can't continue to play and, you know, still enjoy the game and, and get up and down the floor and, you know, a men's league or whatever, but you only get one chance to play high school basketball. And I think if there's any players out there listening, I think the, the lesson to learn from what Jake has said is, you know, give it everything that you have. If, if you love the game and you want to have a good career, the more time that you can put into it and dedicate to it, the better your results are going to be. And I yep. think that you, you want to be able to look yourself in the mirror and not have regrets later on that, man, if I had just done a little bit more, maybe my situation and my story could be different. And again, everybody, you know, you learn from things that happen in your life and and that's really what it's all about. But I think when you can learn from the story that you just shared is, hey, let's put some, you know, put some time in and yeah. really make sure that you're maximizing what you have. Again, if that's what you want. And I think that's what uh, is also important too, is to understand what your, what your motivation is as a player, as a kid, what, what do you want to get out of the experience? Mm-hmm. And, you know, once you make that decision, then you can, then you can act accordingly and figure out what you, what you want to do. So I appreciate you sharing all that stuff about the, uh, you know, about your high school career and, and being honest about it. Cause I think there's a, there's a great message out there for, for basketball players for sure. Oh yeah, of course. And then one more thing that sure. I'll say about that is that if you don't like your role, you're like, you're allowed to change it. Just don't change it in your season because your role is important no matter where you are. But if you don't like your role after a season, like say if you're a freshman, a sophomore, or a junior, you're allowed to put in the work in that off season to change your role. Like you're allowed to do it. it it's just up to you to make that choice to actually do it. So if players are able to understand that they have a choice and that their effort combined with the choices that they make can change their role for the future, like that's going to be important for them because I've seen players like through high school and even college, like they got stuck where they were coming off a bench or they weren't getting much playing time. And then boom, like they just busted their ass the whole summer and they put in that work, they come back and they're a completely different player and, and the coach has to change their roles. Like, so it's up to, like, it's up to the player to be able to, to make it hard on the coach to make that choice. So <laughs> there's, there's that saying, yeah. I think it's Greg, I think it's Greg Pop- Popovich who said something like, make it, make it so hard for me that I, you know, I have to play this guy, I have to play yeah. you. Make it so, yeah. make it so difficult for me get so good that I don't have a choice where, you know, I have to, exactly. I have to put you out, I have to put you out on the floor. And I think that's a, that's a great piece of advice for players out there. Let's talk a little bit about your college decision. Mm-hmm. So uh, talk about uh, how you ended up going to Ohio state, why you decided to pass maybe on potential opportunity to play division three basketball. Just take us back to your mindset and, and kind of walk us through that process. Cause I think there's probably, kids out there that are that are listening that are maybe in that same position of trying to decide what what might be best for them so maybe if you share kind of what your thinking was at that time it may be beneficial to them right okay yeah so my junior my junior and senior year I was predominantly getting recruited by division three schools 
uh, from the area in all over Ohio. Um, so that was like John Carroll, uh, your capital case, Western, like schools like that. Um, and I, and I went on my visits and, uh, and I loved the school. Um, they offered me a spot on the team. They were able to give me some money off. Um, but after playing for coach Flannery here at St. Ed's and all the experiences that I had with traveling to different tournaments and going out of state and always playing against the best talent. Uh, I felt like if I went to go play D3 basketball, it felt like I might be taking a step backwards instead of forwards. Uh, and that's not to discredit the value of Division Three basketball because I do think it's amazing. Like There are some really good teams out there. There are some really good coaches, and it's a great way to get a good education as well. Um, but that's just a testament to what coach Flannery has built here. Um, and so at the time I had gotten accepted to Ohio state late, I was waitlisted. And when I finally got accepted to Ohio state, like it, like the choice then became, do I go to Ohio state where I only pay $10,000 a year and I get to go to my dream school or do I go to a John Carroll or a Capital, where I'll have to pay anywhere between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars a year, um, and that and and that was a really hard decision for me to make because I didn't want to let basketball go, um, but at the end of the day, I knew I'd be going to my dream school. Like I knew I'd be able to become the person that I was meant to be there, and there would be a lot of opportunity for me to get involved with different things and and still stay involved with basketball somehow, some way. Um, so I had to make the uncomfortable calls to the coaches to let them know that I'd be going to Ohio State. Uh, but that's where I inevitably ended up going. And then I'm sure you had a hard time finding pickup games on campus, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Ohio State, their recreational facilities are probably the best in the world, right? It's such a big school to where you have you have the main place called the RPAC, which has let's see one two three four five six seven eight I think ten like ten full size basketball courts there, um, and then you had and then you had three other ones spread around the campus that had at least two full size basketball courts at each of those, um, and something that I found my freshman year in college was like. I had a lot of time. I had a lot of free time and like, I didn't know what to do with myself. Like I was trying to stay involved as best as possible. Um, but we we're back on quarters then. Uh, and you only had to take like three classes per quarter. Um, so my first class was at eight o'clock in the morning and then I was done by 10. And then I had another class from 11 to like 12, 15. And then, and then I had a third class from like four to six. Uh, so, so that, so those were like large chunks of gaps of time to where I needed to fill it or otherwise I was going to go crazy. <laughs> um, so like I, so like I took full advantage of, of the pickup basketball. Actually, my, actually my routine was I would wake up, I go to class and then I would go to the gym to lift. And then I would go to my second class. And after my second class, I would go back to the gym just to get shots up. And then I would go to my third class. And after my third class was when I would go to the RPAC or I would go to, it was called J.O. for Jesse Owens, uh, J.O. South. And I would play pickup basketball for about three hours. So, like, that was, like, my routine, like, every single day for the whole year. Yeah, I, I had friends that when I was in school that, went to Ohio State, and they would always say, you could pretty much find a game 24 hours a day. If you, oh, wanted, yeah. to find, if you wanted to find a 2 a.m. run, you could. Oh, there were definitely could, 2 a.m. runs, yeah. You could, you, could find, you could find a 2 a.m. run if you wanted one. So it's like, uh, it's like basketball nirvana there when you just, uh, you know, if you want to play pickup basketball, you, you, can, you can find a game at Ohio State pretty much any time, any time of day. So as a sophomore, 
you get a chance to you start looking around and and you say hey maybe i'm gonna give the try give this tryout uh a chance maybe try to walk on to uh to the buckeyes basketball team so talk a little bit about what a prompted you to make that decision and then b kind of what the tryout experience was like and you know and how you how you felt when you made it okay yeah so these are gonna be, so this is a very important part so i came into ohio state weighing about a buck 95 200 and then at the end of my freshman year i was 235 pounds i was in the best shape of my life and i've been playing basketball every single day and like there like there came a point in the spring probably around april of my freshman year that was like i've gotten so much better at basketball just from doing this just every single day like i've been pretty successful playing the pickup basketball games like even in the off season for the football team, like those guys would go to the gym to play pickup basketball because a lot of those guys were like big time basketball recruits as well. Uh, and, and I was holding my own against those guys. Um, so I texted coach Flanner. I was like, Hey, look, I feel like I've gotten good enough. Uh, to like actually play basketball here as a walk on, like, do you know anybody here? that you could talk to to see if they're having tryouts or anything. And he was kind of bewildered when I asked him that <laughs> just, just cause he knew what he, just because he knew what I was back when I was playing for him. Now, had and he it, seen you since, I mean, had you, had you gone back like to a game or anything? Had he seen yeah, you since? Yeah. Is, okay. Yeah. So I had, I think I stopped by a couple of games um, back when I was home on break and then and then when they came down, like, I think they came down for the tournament that year. I can't remember. Well, I'm not sure if they made a Final Four run that year or what. Actually, yes, they did, because they ended up winning the state championship. Uh, so so I had seen them a couple times, but, like, I didn't tell them that I was playing every day. Um, like, I was so busy with class and trying, and trying to maintain my routine that we didn't really get too much of a chance to talk. Uh, so when I hit him up, he, he was definitely like taken back by my request. <laughs> yeah. So he hit up coach Bowles, um, who's now the head coach at Ohio. Um, and he said, yeah, I got a guy who thinks he's good enough to try out. Um, and then coach Bowles, he gave me a call that August leading into my second year. Just, uh, he, he just wanted to know a little bit more about me. Um, and then after our conversation, he was like, yeah, we're still trying to decide if we're having tryouts, uh, we'll let you know, just stay ready. Um, and then it was like the last week in September, I got an email from the director of operations for the basketball team saying that they were having tryouts the first week of October. Here's where, here's where you need to be. And, and I showed up and I had a really good day and like, the whole making of the team was like a pretty complex process from my perspective. Um, how many kids were at the tryout? So how many kids were at the tryout, first of all? I, around, I, I want to say around 30. Okay. There were, there were 30 kids. Like There was this one kid that I thought for sure that they were going to take. I was like, I have no chance. But my focus was, for me, like I, I like to pride myself on being a cerebral person. Uh, like I knew in my mind that they weren't looking for somebody who was going to come in and like play and like score a whole bunch of points. Like I, like I figured that that wasn't what they were. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like I figured. Understood. That's yeah. What, no, it makes yeah, total, like, makes total sense. You weren't, you weren't trying to impress them to be the guy that could come in and score 30 a game for them. But exactly, you thought, man, yeah. if I can, sh if I can show them that I have, the ability to be a quote practice player and do the things that mm -hmm. they might actually value that that would give you a better chance. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was just the guy that was talking the whole time and I was doing a lot of encouragement. I was talking on defense. Uh, I was always trying to be the first person to the next drill. And I was always the first one to step up and volunteer um, to do something um, like my preparation the preceding year like paid off like I was knocking down shots like I showed that I could play basketball um and so after the tryout they were like all right thank you guys um 
we'll shoot you an email here in the next couple of days of letting you know of our decision. Uh, so we all walked out of there and we had no idea. And then two days later, I got an email back from the director of operations and I saw that there was another kid from the tryout who was CC'd on it. And they said that they wanted us to come back for further evaluation. Um, so like, I was like very excited, but I knew from the email that further evaluation didn't guarantee that I had a spot on the team. <laughs> so on that first tryout, did they just have you play? Was that pretty uh, much all you did or what did, or what did that, what did that consist of? So they ran us through a whole bunch of like drills, like how okay. you normally start a practice. So you would do like a warm up, uh, you would do like three man weave to, a, and then you do a five man weave and then you would do position shooting. Like they didn't really break us down to positions. Gotcha. They did, okay. Yeah. Like they just had us do a whole bunch of different shooting. Um, and then from there, uh, we did, we did some five man break to three on two, two on two on one, and then back to one on one. That was another big drill that we did. Um, and then eventually they broke us down into five on five teams. And then we just played like four minute segments against Got each it. other. And then that was kind of like the last thing. All right. So they call you back and what's the further evaluation look like? Yeah. So myself and Andrew Goldstein, um, he was the other walk on that ended up making the team as well. Uh, we came back and we're just in our street clothes and then boom, we're practicing with the Ohio state basketball team. And it just didn't feel real to me. I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, there's Aaron Kraft and Deshaun Thomas, Sam Thompson, Shannon Scott. You have Lenzel Smith. You have LaQuinn Ross. Like you have all these dudes that like, I had been idolizing for the last couple of years and like I'm on the same court as them. What did I get myself into? Uh, so they didn't like, they gave us a practice Jersey to throw on over top. Uh, and then we just got involved in drills when we could. Uh, they didn't have us do any of the five on five stuff, but we just stood on the sidelines and watched. Um, and then after practice again, uh, they, they were like, thanks guys for showing up. Uh, we'll shoot you an email tonight and we'll let you know our decision. And so then Andrew and I, we had like talked to each other. We were like, oh man, like, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. Like, I think that you're going to make it. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, God, I hope they pick me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then that night, like we got another email and I saw that the two of us were on it again. And they were like, we want you guys to come back for further evaluation. Here's when practice is. And that went on for like two weeks straight. Two weeks. Without like, without without them telling you, hey, you made it. It was just correct. to continue yeah, yeah, to evaluate. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah. So like every single like practice, like we were just like Andrew and I, we just kept looking at each other like, when the hell are they going to put us out of our misery? Because like we just wanted to know. Um, right. Yeah, I can imagine that had to be like a stressful, oh yeah, a stressful two week period where you, I'm sure your focus on anything else was rather distracted. Yeah, yeah. I think that was the first time my grades kind of took a hit because I was just I more focused I could, on I could, that. I could see that. I could see <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but then there came that day where after practice, uh, everybody had left the gym, uh, and the director of operations he asked us to hang around, and then in and then in comes Coach Mata, and the four of us, we all sit down. So it's me, Coach Mata, Andrew, and our director of operations, Dave Egelhoff. And we just sat down, and then Coach Mata was like, I just want to let you guys know you both have made the team. And then Andrew and I, like, we had the same reaction. Like, our shoulders should just, like, sank, like, <sighs> like, thank you, like, thank you, like, thank you for making all this happen. Like it was the greatest feeling in the world. Like I didn't think in a million years that, that I'd ever hear those words coming out of a legend's mouth, like coach Mata. Like it, like I still remember it like crazy. Oh, it was a great day. I have to imagine again, as you said, that it was kind of unreal to go from, 
all right, maybe I'm going to play some Division three basketball. Eh, maybe I'm not. I'm just going to go to school. And then all of a sudden now, boom, here you are, you know, growing up in Ohio, growing up obviously a fan of Ohio State in multiple sports. And now here you are suddenly on Ohio State's basketball team over the course of that, you know, whatever that period was, three weeks or so. You go from, hey, I think I'm going to try out to suddenly now I'm I'm on the team. I mean, it had to just be – Mm-hmm. It had to just be an incredible, an incredible feeling, as you've described, just being out there with <clears throat> guys who have been, you know, big time national recruits and, and guys that, you know, your friends are watching on TV and that you had seen play and all that kind of thing. And now mm-hmm. suddenly here you are right out in the midst of them. Yep. And that just hammers back to the point that we were talking about a little bit ago is that you don't have to be stuck in your role. Like all like. All it takes is just one year of hard work. Just doing that for one solid year, like you can become a totally different person. And then that's kind of when that idea just really like sank in. And and I've never gone back from it. Like every single year, like I'm just trying to put in as much work as possible to become a better me. So I'm always A, I'm going towards my goals and then B, I'm making the people around me a lot better. Yeah, that's a great way to approach not just your basketball career or your professional career. It's a great way to go through life is to be able to make sure that you're always trying to maximize yourself and in turn then maximize the people around you. Coaches, check out these new offerings from Tyler Whitcomb Basketball Coaching Courses. The Brad Brownell Clemson Playbook and Baker Dunleavy Quinnipiac Playbook are now available. These two coaches are among the most respected tacticians in the country. Visit coachtube.com slash users slash Tyler Whitcomb to check out these great resources. You're on the team now. Talk a little bit about what the experience was like in terms of how you how you fit in with with the team, did you feel like you were quote a part of it? Were you? Did you still feel like there was a, a disconnect? So talk about how you, of course, sort of integrated with the players and what that relationship was like, and then what it was like with the coaching staff. Okay, yeah. So there definitely was a little bit of an adjustment because by the time I came in, these guys had already gone through a full summer. They've already gone through their preseason practices, like. By the time that I make the team, it's the beginning of November. Um, So things are picking up like quick. And so there definitely was a period where it was hard to build solid relationships with guys um, and the coaches because A, they don't really know you. Right. And then then B, they're more focused on trying to play the best that they possibly can and try and coach the best that they possibly can. So I was an afterthought in the most reasonable way. Um, But as time progressed and the more I proved myself in practice um, and the more I proved myself like off the court and like trying to talk to these guys and hang out with them, uh, that's when those relationships like uh, started to solidify and like these guys go from being complete strangers to some of my best friends now. Um, and the same with the coaching staff, like the coaching staff took a little bit more time and that's very understandable now that I've gone through kind of the coaching side of college and even high school just just seeing how much is on their place constantly taking a look back now like it all makes sense um but i think after i finished my first year um and i proved myself both on and off the court and i lived up to my role and their expectations of me that's when the trust started to build um and we started to become a little bit more like fluid in our communications and, and like I really started to get the sense that like I, I was here for good and I was a very important part of the team. All right. So two questions. One, 
in that first year, was there one or two guys from the team that were sort of the first ones to kind of reach out to you and make you feel a part of it? Was there somebody that came to you and reached out to you? So that's the first Mm -hmm. question. And then the second question, which we can come back to is, did you have to go through the tryout process again in your second year? So that, I guess that's just a yes or no question that we can elaborate or not, and then go back to the one about uh, you know somebody reaching out to you, one of the players who kind of made you feel like, hey, you really are a part of it. Okay. Yeah, so to go to your second point, when they told us that we had made the team, they told us it was a one-year deal. Um, and so I go through the first season, and then after the season uh, – this is probably like this is probably like a week after we lost in the Elite Eight. Um, I go into Coach Maya's office and I say, "Hey, Coach, I just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, like, uh, I like I know that this was a one-year deal, so I just want to say thank you, and I'll get all my stuff cleaned out." He's like, "What are you talking about, Jake?" I was like, you said it was a one-year deal. And he was like, no, dude, you're coming back. Like, we want you back. Uh, so, that was, so that was a really cool feeling. Like, I can't tell if he was serious or if that was just like a ploy to get me to really get to really get the best out of me in one year. Like, I'm not sure. Like, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Uh, and, I, and I don't think that he'll ever tell me. Right. Uh, his reasons for doing that because it might have been a one year deal. Like say if I like say if I slacked around and like I wasn't and and I wasn't living up to their expectations of me, like it very well could have been just a one year deal. But that was a really cool feeling to know that they wanted me back. Um That's very cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And then as far as teammates reaching out to me, the first one was Alex Rogers. So Alex was the walk-on currently there. Uh, so he was a senior. I'm pretty sure they put him on scholarship his senior year. So he was so he was on scholarship at that point. But he had started as a walk-on. So he took me under his wing, and he really groomed me to be the best version of my role that I possibly could be. Like, he, like he always let me know when I was trying to do too much. Um or when like I'm not doing enough or say if or say if I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing in a drill like he'd be the first one to correct me um and I'm very thankful for him and I'm very thankful that he did that for me because if he didn't like I probably would have been very lost out there um and so we became close that year and then he graduated and he moved on uh but then throughout the course of the year, Sam Thompson and I became very close. Um, we were studying the same thing. We were like, we were both in business background. We had like a similar style of humor. Um, and the things that we were interested in outside of basketball, he's a very intellectual person. Uh, so it was very fun to like have discussions with him about different ideas and things going on in the world outside of basketball. Like that was very very refreshing because during the course of the season you can get so fixated on basketball that you forget about everything else but he helped me realize that there's more to life than just basketball all right so just like i asked you from your high school career give me one or two highlights things that stand out memories from your time on the ohio state basketball team Ooh. okay man there are, there are a couple different ones. So the first one that jumps out to me is definitely winning the Big Ten championship my first year on the team. Like that, it felt like a dream, and it still does. Just we beat Wisconsin, and then the horn sounds, the confetti's falling, somebody's handing you a T-shirt and a hat, and they're building stage just right in front of you, and – I felt like this couldn't be real, but it was <laughs> like, it's like Ricky Bobby from Talladega nights. Like, I'm not sure what to do with my hands. 
uh <laughs> like i'm yeah. just like oh, <laughs> holy heck this just yeah. happened like i'm here like a year ago like i like i had no idea that any of this was going to happen and just and just for that experience that happened in my first year it was just i'm just so lucky and blessed to like it, like it was kind of like my life just flashing before my eyes, like all of the good things and the bad things that happened, like in my basketball career, just flashed before my eyes, and, and like it all led me to this moment. So like that's something I'll never forget. Um, let's see, another one happened two games later against Iowa State. <laughs> it was when Aaron Kraft hit a, the the buzzer beater, quote unquote, against Iowa State in the round of 32 in the tournament. See, I thought the buzzer had gone off. And so I went running on the floor, but there was actually like 0.2 seconds or 0.3 seconds left on the clock. And so there was nobody else out there with me. And like, I had to run backwards towards the bench and like guys were grabbing me and like they built a wall around me just to hide me from the referees because, like, I very easily could have been called for a technical foul don't for that. Get a t- don't get a T, Jake. Yeah. Don't get a T. Oh, man. <clears throat> that that was that was, that was was very nerve-wracking, but, but, like, that was a very funny moment. So um, do you have that on video? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, yeah. You, yeah, if you go on YouTube and you, and you type in Aaron Kraft buzzer beater uh, against Iowa State, like, you, you'll see me yeah, just get out there deep. We might have to throw that on the show notes. <laughs> yeah, like I give you full permission because it's very funny. Right. Yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> just like yeah, because like they kept playing it like over and over and over again on TV because they were trying to figure out the time on the clock. Uh, so like every single time, like probably like six times in a row, you just see me just running out of the damn near the free throw line. That's funny. That's just funny. all by myself. Yeah. Uh, so that was a really, that was probably something I'll never forget. Uh, and then the third one that sticks out the most to me was halfway through my junior year, uh, getting put on scholarship in the way that happened. Um, it was so the previous game, so this is when D'Angelo Russell was with us at Ohio State. Uh, we were playing at Northwestern. And D'Angelo was just putting on a show, like, like he was making the craziest passes. He was getting to the rim, like he was doing everything. He was playing defense, like it. It was one of his better games. And there was one play where he broke a dude's ankles at the top of the key, um, and he hit a three. And I lost my mind, and so and I put my hands behind my head, and I and like I was trying to run out of the gym. But there were like people blocking the tunnel way, so I had to run back. <laughs> uh, and so we get back, and then the next practice, because we always watch film before practices. Um, and so we all sit down, and coach plays the clip of D'Angelo. He's breaking the dude's ankles, and then you see me go nuts. He stops it, and, it, and, it, and, he, and he doesn't say a word, and he rewinds it. And he plays it again, and he rewinds it, and he plays it again. And he stands up, and he says, Jake, I love that crap so much that I'm going to put you on scholarship. I was like, you're, <laughs> wait, are you kidding? And, 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 and I was like, are you serious? And, and he said, hell yeah. And then everybody just went bananas. And so and like they were all jumping on me, like clapping and stuff like that. And That's awesome. Yeah. And like I'm happy that that wasn't recorded because that's that's definitely like a moment that like I'd rather just have in my memory forever. Uh, yeah, understood. And, and just have it be our thing. But like that was a really, really, really cool moment. So those are kind of like my three favorite moments playing, that's awesome. playing basketball at okay. Ohio State. That's all good stuff. I mean, again, the experiences that I'm sure you got to have and the places that you got to go and, and the games and the, and the teammates that you got to play with and all that stuff is just, again, there's no way that you could ever convey that to somebody who didn't get those experiences. Mm-hmm. What, 
what those opportunities were like. And I'm sure what they meant to you at the time and what they're going to continue to, to mean to you throughout the course of your life. All right. So let's jump into kind of where you headed after Ohio state. So you graduate from school and at that point, your basketball career finishes up and you go out into the real world and Mm -hmm. you get a job at, at this point, when you got done, any thought ever that coaching might be something that you'd be interested in? Or at this point, were you just like, basketball is kind of in the rearview mirror. Maybe I'll play and, and do some things or you know, continue to be a fan and whatever, play in some men's leagues. But just where where were you with basketball as you go out into the real world and, and get a job as a financial advisor? Gotcha. So my senior year – I actually was in it, was unable to play. Uh, I ended up getting three concussions in three months before the season. Uh, so, like, that was the moment where I was like, all right, my playing career is done. Like, I want to risk doing more damage to my brain That's for sure. that, than what's already been done. Uh, so, when I graduated, like, I, like, I thought I might be able to do the whole coaching thing. But I wasn't married to the idea yet, uh, so I so I had this degree in consumer and family financial services, which which basically means I studied to be a financial planner uh, slash financial advisor. So I took a job with this startup firm uh, in Santa Monica, um, and I and I went out there and I was and I was working with ultra high net worth clients. Like I was smiling and dialing. I was making three hundred cold calls a day. <laughs> uh, and just being away from home, like, uh, on, on top of really needing shoulder, really needing shoulder surgery, like I put it off. Um, I just decided that it was best if I go home and get my shoulder fixed. Um, so, and I came back, I did that. And then in my recovery process, like, the, like I, like I knew I needed to be out of my sling before I decided to go back to work. Uh, so I had like a gap of time where I decided to coach some fifth grade AAU boys basketball. Uh, and so I did that for about two months. And then that's when, that's when I got the coaching bug. I was like, all right, like this opened up Pandora's box. Like, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to (laughs) shut it off. So I took, so I took a job with PNC investments and it was a really good job and it was really good people that I was working for. Like I was helping people out financially. Like I was helping them achieve their dreams, like, and try to reach their goals, like financially. So that was really rewarding. But every single day, like I was just thinking like, man, I, man, I need to get back into basketball now. Like I need to get back. I need to get back. Uh, and that thought was just running through my head like every day. And then there just came a day like where I was like, all right, let's do it. So I typed up my resignation letter and handed it in that day, which hindsight probably could have done a little bit better planning, but it was a heat of the moment thing. Uh, so I quit my job. Um, and then I hit up Cleveland state to see if they would take me as a volunteer. And they said they would. So I started substitute teaching and then traveling to Cleveland state, uh, for their practices to help out and, any way I could. And that's kind of how I got into it. And so, all right. So here's the question. When you go from, again, coaching fifth grade AAU and that kind of gets you, Hey, I like this coaching thing. And now you go and you volunteer for a division one program in Cleveland state Mm -hmm. and you're on the coaching staff. And so now you're kind of behind the scenes whereas before when you're at Ohio State you're on the playing side of it and I always find it interesting when I ask this question just what people say what surprised you about the coaching side of it when you first kind of went behind the curtain of coaching at the college level what was something that either was surprising to you what was something that you didn't expect what was something that was different from what you thought it was going to be based on your experience as a player, what was something you didn't realize? Um, I I would say like, as soon as I hopped on Cleveland state staff, 
uh, and they took me as a grad assistant, uh, I developed a great appreciation for what coaches do because I didn't realize the sheer amount of volume of work that they have to do on a daily basis just outside of like the X's and O's and what, and what we have to do in practice because there's the recruiting and then you have to develop the relationships with players and then you have to, and then you have to talk to all the administration at the university and you have to promote the program and you have to travel, you have to go recruit, you have to scout, you have to do all these different things. And as a player, you don't see those things. Like the only, like the only things that you see are what you do as a team um, and what you do with coaches outside of team activities, like as far as your skill development goes. Uh, and so I, I was really like taken back, surprised and probably overwhelmed by everything that comes along with coaching uh, just because it's a lot of work that a lot of people don't see on a daily basis. Like, like you're in the office from seven in the morning till 10 o'clock at night sometimes. And like, you, you might be there later. Like it just depends on what you have going on and it depends on the point in the season. Like you're constantly, you're making calls to players uh, and to recruits and the parents and the coaches and, 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 and you're not just thinking about the year that's happening right now. Like you're trying to plan for years down the line. And so having to do all those things seamlessly at the same time, like, like that's something like my volunteer and my grad assistant position that opened my eyes up to it. Um, and then as well from the operational side, like I've, like I have a greater appreciation for what director of operations do now that I had to help, uh, the two director of operations that we had in my time with Cleveland state be, because it's a lot. Um, and then I would say probably like the one big difference that I've seen, like coming as a player from Ohio state to going to a mid-major program like Cleveland state is the amount of resources that you have at your discretion. Um, just because like the size, the size and the successes of the two different programs are completely different. Uh, like at Ohio state, like it's like it's a million dollar, uh, revenue generating school. Whereas you go to Cleveland state and like, you've only been averaging like, maybe like a thousand fans a game like for the last like five or six years so you're not generating that much revenue so the amount of resources that you have at your discretion uh to help enhance and enrich the programs is completely different um so seeing from a coach's standpoint like the savviness and the ability to maximize the resources that you do have, like I think I heard Tony Robbins say this one time, it's like, it's not the resources that you have, but it's the amount of resourcefulness that you possess. So like your ability to maximize the resources that you do have. So coaches at mid-major level, like I have a greater appreciation for what they do be, because they're trying to do the same amount of things that the bigger programs are doing, but with a lot less. That makes, makes total. Sense. I mean, yeah, no, it makes complete sense. I think you hit on, you know, a theme that we hear a lot, which is, you know, again, I had no idea that, you know, as a player, I think you see your coach at the, you see your coaching staff at your practice, and you think, okay, well, yeah, they plan practice, and you know, maybe that took an hour, and they had a little meeting, and then you know, they came into practice, and then you know, and they go home. And you don't see all those operational things. You don't see all those things that, as you said, are planning for not just the current season where we are, but also seasons ahead and just looking at building the entirety of the program. And as a player, you take those things for granted. You don't know all that stuff that goes on behind mm -hmm. the scenes. And then I think there, you know, clearly there's a difference in budget when you're talking about a big 10 program like Ohio state, or you're talking about a mid major program like Cleveland state. And it forces the coaches who are at each level again, to adjust to, 
what they have and and make do and make the best of it. I think that's again kind of the lesson that you've been sharing throughout this entire podcast is, you know, whatever situation you're put in, try to maximize mm-hmm. it and make make the most of it. So we'll end up kind of back where we started at St. Ed's with Coach Flannery. Two things related to St. Ed's and what you're doing now. So first of all, talk a little bit about what your role is day to day. And then two, give us a sense of how maybe your perspective on Coach Flannery changed from you obviously knew him for a long time as a player. Now as a part of his coaching staff, that relationship dynamic had cha- has changed. So again, maybe talk about something that surprised you about coach Flannery behind the scenes or something that you didn't realize that he did, or just something that maybe was different from how you perceived him as a player that now, Mm -hmm. as you've seen him as, uh, you know, as a part of his coaching staff, how that, how you're looking, how you're looking at it might be different. Okay. Yeah. So I'll go back to my role first. So on a daily basis. So just as a refresher, like I handle, all the video as far as as far as cutting up practices, games. Um, I'm running the film sessions. Um, I'm doing it. I'm doing some individual stuff for players. Like say, if I see some bad habits um, that they have in games or practices, or I, or like I'll show it to them and we'll talk through it and we'll try to correct it. Um, and I. And I like to do the same thing with the good things that they're doing. So just to hammer home, like there are some things that we need to fix, but you are doing a good job. Um, uh, then as far as player development goes, uh, I'll, I'll either meet them before school. So around, so anywhere between 6.30 and 7 in the morning. And we we'll, we'll go up until about like 10 minutes before school starts. So they have enough time to get changed and they can make it to class. Uh, or I'll stay after practices to get some extra shots up. Um, so those are kind of my main duties, uh, during games, like I'll sit on the bench and I'll try to give my input where fit, uh, and when necessary. Um, like I never tried to talk over the other coaches or coach Flannery, like I, like I value and, and I respect their positions because I'm the new guy here. Um, but I just try to give my input where I think it fits. Um, and then in practices, it's the same thing. So like I usually work with the bigs here. Um, so I try to help out with skill stuff with them and, and then afterwards, like probably after practices is when I get a lot of the guards who want to come up and, and get some extra shots up. Uh, I guess segueing into my relationship with Coach Flannery now that I'm coaching with him, uh, there was definitely – it was weird at first. I'm sure it was. <laughs> yeah. I can, ima- I, can, I can imagine. Yeah, just because, like, I knew him as my coach. And so – can you call him Eric yet? I don't. I don't think I'll ever call him Eric. Well, like I just don't think that that's ever going to be a thing. Like I'm gonna, well, I'm just gonna call him Coach, or I'm yep. gonna call him Flan, or I'm gonna call him Coach yep. Flannery. Like just so like a thing. Understood. It's like I'm never gonna call my dad Tom. Like correct. I, right. I, I know like, exactly. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. I have my high school coach. If whenever I see him, I would never. His name's Bob Casey. I would never call him. Hey, Bob, how are you? I would always still call him. <laughs> yeah, hey, Coach yeah. Coach Casey, how are you? Yeah. So that's that's definitely been a big adjustment for me. Um, just because, as far as our discussions go, like our like our like our coaches' meetings, um, the things that we talk about as far as like our players go, our game plan goes. Um, and what we're going to do, like it definitely opened up my eyes because like I started to have some memories back to when I was playing and like, I always wondered why we switched to doing this, or I always wondered why are we doing this? And then, er and then early on here, especially early in the season, 
like I started to get a taste of it. So I'm like, oh, okay. So now like the dots are starting to connect. Um, so that's kind of like having some deja vu. Um, but it's been great so far. I, I feel, I feel like he trusts me. Um, I, I listened to the podcast that you actually did with him. And one of the things that he hammered home early on was he likes to hire guys that he can trust. And that's not something that he like just says just for show. Like it's something that he right, actually like right. believes in for sure. Yeah. And he, and he's not shy to tell me when I'm wrong. And like, I hope he never is. Like, I hope he tells me when I'm saying the wrong things or if there's something that I can say in a better way. Um, but like for, especially during the film sessions too, um, he gives me a lot of freedom, which I like. Um, and he lets me have my voice and he, and he doesn't try to talk over me. Um, and it's, and it's just been like a really like fluid and dynamic and productive relationship that we've started to build as coaches together. That's awesome. I think for you, it's gotta be a thrill to be able to be oh, back yeah. at, you know, your high school where you played and uh, as part of your coaching journey to be able to, to work and learn under a guy who you learned from as a player. And now you get an opportunity to learn from him as a coach. And obviously with his success that he's had over the course of a long coaching career, you know, it, 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 there, there's, there's nobody better uh, I think to learn from, than coach Flannery. And so I guess we're coming up on close to an hour and a half. So I want to ask you mm -hmm. one final question and mm -hmm. then we'll wrap things up. And that question is, as you look forward now in your coaching career, what do you see as your goal? What level do you see yourself coaching at? Do you have any, again, I'm not talking about a specific job that you're looking for, but just in general, if you look out into the future, do you see yourself wanting to be, a high school coach? Do you see yourself wanting to get back into college? Do you see yourself going a different direction? Just where do you see your career headed? And then after you answer that, we'll jump back in, give you a chance to let people know how they can reach out to you. And then we'll wrap up the episode. That's a really good question. Um, I would have to say if I could wave a magical wand and have all my dreams come true, I would want to be, a division one head basketball coach with a very successful program where I'm there for 15 years and I'm able to change players lives. I'm, I'm able to help them become a greater person. If that's boys or girls, like, like, I don't know where I'm going to end up. Um, but to be a division one head basketball coach at the college level, and just to like have that impact on players' lives and help them achieve their dreams. Like that's something that I wish that I lay down every single night and I think about. But right now, I love exactly where I'm at. Like I'm learning a whole bunch. Like like I love our kids. Like they're very hard workers. They're great kids. So. It's hard for me to look into the future when, when I have so many great things in front of me right now. That's an awesome answer. And I'm going to piggyback on that with something that we've talked about with a couple of different coaches. And it was first shared with us by actually Coach Flannery's friend, uh, Coach Showalter, that he, Eric works with uh, at USA Basketball. And Coach Showalter came on the podcast and he talked about how you know, he's had an opportunity, he coached in Iowa high school basketball for 42 mm -hmm. years. And he talked about how young coaches go up to him and say, hey, how can I get the opportunities, you know, that you have? How can I get to where you are? And the advice that he shared with us that he shares with young coaches is you have to do the best job that you possibly can in the position where you're in now. Mm -hmm. And if you do the best job with the kids and the players that are in front of you, somebody's going to notice. And when somebody notices that, that's what's going to open up the next opportunity for you. And if, if you have one foot out the door or you have one eye 
looking at the next opportunity and you're not putting your best effort into what you're doing at the very moment, you're going to end up losing opportunities instead of gaining them. And I think that's exactly. just a tremendous piece of advice. And I think that's what you just shared mm -hmm. is that's, that's where you're at in your career. Um, Jake, it's been a pleasure to get a chance to dig into your story. Oh, learn I've more had a about, blast, man. Yeah. It, it, thank you so much for having me on here. Yeah. No, we've, we've, uh, we've enjoyed the conversation. I think there's a lot of value uh, in your story, both for players and for young coaches out there who might be listening. So we can't thank you enough for jumping on with us. Before we go, just give people an opportunity <laughs> to uh, let them know where they can reach out to you, whether that's your social media, whether that's email, however you think uh, is the best way for people to reach out to you, share that, and then I'll jump back on and we'll wrap it up. Got it. Yeah, so I have kind of done a social media ban except for Twitter. So if you want to give me a follow, you can follow me on Twitter at Coach Lorbach. That's L-O-R-B as in boy, A-C-H. Um, or you can shoot me an email. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's my last name followed by my first name. So it's LorbachJacob at gmail.com. So if you ever want to talk shop or you want to just pick my brain or if you have any questions uh, or if you can offer me some advice, I'm always looking for it. Uh, you can reach out to me those ways. Awesome. Jake, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Registration is now open at headstartbasketball.com for this summer's Head Start Basketball Camps. We'll be hosting camps for boys and girls in grades 1 through 6 throughout the greater Cleveland area. Get registered today and make sure you hit the courts with us this summer. Thanks for listening to the Hoopheads Podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.